So thank you all for being here and thank you for letting me be here. Was it really a year ago that I was with you on Zoom and preached a sermon called Gratitude in Difficult Times? My junior high school Latin teacher, Mr. Bishop, was inordinately fond of mixing English and Latin words together in a sentence. And one of his favorite sayings was, Tempest keeps fugiting. It certainly did during the weekly vocabulary conjugation and declension test he gave every Thursday. And it seems to keep on doing so as the years go by. When I was here with you last year, I talked about how gratitude, like love, is not just a feeling. Instead, it's a responsibility. It's not just about what we have. Instead, it's a forward dynamic that keeps us asking, what is mine to do with all that I have this afternoon, this coming week, and every day for the rest of my life. What of mine do others need and how can I give that to them in the simplest way? How can we share with the kind of generosity that will begin to heal the wounds we've inflicted on each other and on the earth? During these past 52 weeks, Individuals and businesses and governments and congregations have done the very strange dance of emerging briefly from pandemic restrictions, only to retreat back into them as the Delta variant spread the virus in new and alarming ways. Many fully vaccinated people experienced breakthrough COVID and people who refused to be vaccinated are now filling up hospital beds and emergency rooms everywhere. Medical people are overworked, dismayed, and exhausted. And garden variety citizens like me are filled with equal amounts of rage and sorrow that much of this could have been prevented if there had been unselfish national leadership when all this began back in early 2020. And now, of course, democracy as we've known it all of our lives is in great danger. And here we are again at another American holiday where the idea is to give thanks, which sometimes seems like a big ask. But during this past year, my gratitude, and maybe yours too, has increased exponentially. Gratitude for life itself and for vaccines and for love and community and congregation. And we clearly have thousands of things, things to be thankful for. So what I want to do today is to talk not about gratitude and thanksgiving, but what I think is their spiritual extension, which is generosity. At one of the large worship services during the UU General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, back in 2016, the minister extended the invitation to the offering by saying, may we give with irrational generosity. Those words have stayed with me and have changed me. And I want us this morning to think together about what generosity is and what it does. As with every topic that stirs my soul, I started doing some research and reading about generosity, which is considered to be a virtue by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But the teachings about generosity in the texts of these three Abrahamic religions sometimes have a whiff of bargaining about them. Give generously so you will receive blessings in return. This kind of message is not to my liking because I think real generosity comes from an overwhelming desire in our hearts for others to experience the abundance we experience with no expectation of our receiving anything in return. 
What interested and appealed to me most as I expanded my reading about generosity was how the precept is handled within Buddhism. I am not by any stretch of the imagination a Buddhist in belief or practice, but over the years I've learned much from this Eastern theo philosophy about principled living, quieting the mind, and acceptance of all that is. On a personal note, what most influenced my decision in 2005 to retire from the legal profession after 30 years was Buddhism's concept of right livelihood, which I realized I was no longer practicing. So I've come to have great respect for Buddhist thought, including its highly important teaching about generosity, which is often at odds with our self-involved, materialistic, distracted, and absurdly over-consuming culture. In fact, one of the three central practices of Buddhism is dana, or generosity. Like many Buddhist teachings, the practice of generosity is largely entwined with the workings of the mind and the heart. And far, far more important than what is being given is that the giver feels joyous before, during, and after the act of giving that the only so-called reward that might be obtained is a spiritual deepening, and that being generous is not limit, limited to the giving of charity, donations, or money, but also includes a variety of seemingly ordinary acts that we wouldn't normally consider as giving, such as asking the HEB checkout person, what kind of a day are you having? and then taking the time to make eye contact and really listen to the answer. In my 75 years of living, I've come to think of generosity with the equally important gifts of our time and our talent and our money as both a verb and a noun. And I'd like to talk briefly about each of those aspects, starting with what generosity does and then about what it is. First, as love and compassion and action, generosity is a wonderfully contagious and multiplying force that animates individuals, communities, congregations, cultures, and the world at large. Whenever I hear anyone say, I only have $10 to give, and I can't imagine that it will make any difference anywhere. I remind them that most food banks can buy 15 to $20 worth of food wholesale for every dollar received in donations. Or I point them to the website of ripmedicaldebt.org, a highly regarded and highly rated 501c3 that buys and pays off medical debts for pennies on, on the dollar. As its website notes, for every $100 it receives, the organization can pay off $10,000 in medical debts. So the math is easy and obvious. Even a gift of $10 to a well-run organization is multiplied into a generous donation that can buy $150 to $200 of food for for some of the 100 million people in this country who live in poverty. Or that same $10 can liberate someone from $1,000 of soul crushing debt that arises from the medical inequities and injustice that mark the American healthcare system. Second, generosity can transform us into more spiritually creative people. In Denver, several churches, including First Universalist, realized that their parking lots were not being used at all during the pandemic. So they formed a coalition where each church gave over many of its parking spaces to homeless people, either those who were accustomed to sleeping in their cars or those who were accustomed to camping on the street. 
The spaces are kept clean and are watched over by people trained in maintaining safety for vulnerable populations. And the entire creative experience experiment has been a success physically and spiritually. Third, generosity can soothe some of our individual and collective grief over the many losses we've suffered during the pandemic. A woman I know whose spouse died of COVID last December wept tears of joy as she told me about giving her wife's clothing away to an immigrant support organization within a week of the death. All of her pants and sweaters fit me, she said, and part of me wanted to keep them and wear them as a way of remembering her and how stylish and beautiful she was. But it was winter and it was cold. And so many undocumented people here had lost their jobs and were using what little money they had to buy food instead of warm clothing for their families. It's like in Texas, she said, where you and I both grew up. Immigrants hold up more than half the sky. And the more I thought about giving my beloved wife's clothes to them, the less sorrow and grief I felt about losing her. And when I finally dropped the clothes off at the immigrant center, I knew that my own healing had begun. And fourth, for those of us who are white, generosity can be a radical and resistive act of decolonizing our wealth. In other words, it summons us into the risk of taking a long, hard, and critical look at the hundreds of ways in which we as white people have chosen to move and control our money to our personal and therefore our racial advantage. We have directed our money toward white churches and white school systems and white colleges. And we have invested it in, in white businesses and corporations and white neighborhoods. Yet we still insist on knowing and approving of exactly where our money is going and how it'll be used before we give a dime of it to any organization that works for the common good. As our reading for today, for, for today by a poet from a colonized African country urges us, it's time for us to open our tight fist and to redistribute our wealth without restrictions or expectations about how black, indigenous, and people of color use it to create what they need to live their best individual and cultural lives. Besides the many things generosity does, it also is many things. For starters, if we choose to live aligned with the spirit of life and love, generosity is evidence of spiritual formation because if we've learned the meaning of love, we give generously so others may live fully. Generosity is also a spiritual practice, a deepening discipline of witness and faithfulness for people who know that our work is to do justly and to repair the world. Generosity is a prayer, a way of giving from our own abundance and asking God and other human beings to use it in life-giving ways that we can only imperfectly comprehend. And generosity can be a joyful act of worship that frees us, that creates connections among people and dissolves those boundaries that keep abundance from being spread around and that makes our hearts and souls more spacious. Best of all, Generosity reminds us of the amazing grace that has brought us to this day on earth and to this hour together. It's that time of year again 
when our culture starts to race toward the frantic process of buying material things to give to family and friends during the many holidays and celebrations that take place in December and January. Before we get caught up in that sprint, I hope that each of us will spend time over the Thanksgiving weekend not only giving thanks for all that is our life, but also thinking deeply about how we want to give for the remainder of our days and how we can choose generosity as our way of being in the world. May we loosen our grip on all of the time, talents, and treasure that we have. May we know that the best things in life aren't things. May we listen with presence and attention and great love to the needs of others. And may we always give with irrational generosity. Amen.